Hi, and welcome to a RHEL 7 quick start guide. RHEL 7 is now available in alpha, and by the time you're watching this, it may be later than that, but we can get started with it straight away and uh, showcase a new application, all the things that have changed, and some of the new features that you may want to use in your application. So let's get started with that. Uh, in my case, uh, you can just go ahead and go to your console, and you can do gem update to Rails, double dash pre, and it will come with a whole list of spam for you. If you've not done this already, in my case, it'll say nothing to do. In my case, I had to update my Redis gem before doing this, but it, your, your experience may vary. It'll tell you what you actually need to update in that case. However, we have this available. So let's create a new Rails app. Now, I'll rather look at quickly at the help system for it, because a couple of new options here. Major big changes in this release. We have a replacement for Webpacker entirely. It's a, a system that... Um, feels a lot more like the, the sprocket system that used to exist before that, I think. In the, um, the Webpacker system, which wrapped around Webpacker gem, which wrapped around Webpack, you dealt with Yarn, you dealt with M NPM, and that was a bit complicated and a bit non-obvious, really, to people who are used to use, just using the gem file and just using that kind of stuff to deal with things previously. However, it, it worked very well for years. However, now with RHEL 7, there's a big sea change in, in how that's being done because of HTTP 2.0, dealing with lots of files uh, being sent over the wire quite well, and um, import maps being well supported. So we'll go into that briefly in a moment. The other thing is that now we can choose a CSS um, processor and also framework, if you like, when we create our new apps. In this case, Tailwind is an option. Post CSS, SAS is Dart, SAS, and then there is an option for Bootstrap as well. It's not shown here. I think it's not quite working just yet in the alpha release, but um, just to create a new project with Bootstrap straight away or Tailwind straight away is a very nice thing to do. So let's just do exactly that. So Rails new, and then I'm going to just create the to-do app. That would just be great for beginners in the, in the other videos. And uh, let's just add this to my database. So PostgreSQL, in my case, your, yours may differ there. But then I'm going to specify CSS. Tailwind. And off it'll go and create a few bits and pieces, install various uh, bits of gubbins, and then, you know, we can take a look at the big changes to uh, Rails 7. Um, in particular, we're going to start with the gem file, I think. Um, or, in fact, before I forget, let's just create the database <laughs> so I don't forget this and make sure that everything is working. Whoops, uh, Rails DB create. Oh, I'm not in the folder, that's why. Whoops, there we go. Rails DB create and you're up, and let's open a new tab, and then just go and make sure the server is running. So localhost 3000, yes, it's all working. So we're, uh, we're okay <clears throat> there. So from here, yes, let's look at that, uh, that gem file. So let's open it up and take a look at the gem file. So here are the things that have changed. I'm just gonna rearrange this a little bit um, so that uh, everything is in the order I kind of want to discuss it in. So we have, uh, coming from the top down, we have import map, which I just talked about. So that's sort of the replacement for Webpacker and everything else to do with that kind of stuff. There's obviously links to the various guides for that or the various repos. Um, Tailwind CSS, we know that we've specified that. We'll just verify it's working in just a second. And then we've got Turbo and Stimulus Rails. Now these were available for Rails 6, and maybe even before that, but certainly for Rails 6, as something you could add into your project and Turbo Rails is the replacement for what used to be, well, yeah. Um, it's all part of the hot wired framework, basically. Uh, so Turbo and Stimulus are the two. But previously we did have Turbo Links. It's now just called Turbo. And Stimulus is, if you haven't heard of it before, it's a, a sort of a, a JS framework that lets us do a lot with a very small amount of JavaScript. So we can add little bits of JavaScript to get quite a lot working in our apps, but those are sort of independent of Rails 7 themselves. They're just provided by default now, so you can turn them off if you want to, of course. Further down, nothing particularly too um, surprising in here, and just moving down to here. So Bybug is now gone. That's been replaced by this debug gem. I need to look at that myself. I haven't really looked into it too much for this, but we'll, I'll come back to that later. And then a couple of things have been uh, turned off. So we've got Gem Spring is been turned off. Um, Spring was very good at speeding things up on slower computers, but because computers are very fast uh, by comparison to when Spring first came along along the scene, 
it's not on by default, but of course you can just uncomment this to turn it back on if you wish. At Spring there was always a bit of an overhead and you had to remember that it was running in a certain cases, so having it not be something you have to think about is good in that particular case. And then Rack Mini Profiler is kind of handy to actually turn on and then see information at the top left of your browser. However, if you do, if you do turn on that, that on, and bundle of course, make sure it's included, uh, then you'll just want to make sure you restart your server before uh, that will actually appear in the web browser. And then the test group is exactly the same. So those are the changes to the gem file, and uh, that brings us on to looking at the application itself in Rails 7, and let's see how this affects, or let's see how easy Tailwind is, or let's see, first of all, how hard it was previously. So if I go into code and I just go to my uh, Tailwind guide, uh, rather someone else's Tailwind guide I use, um, this is the guide I use. Works very well with Rails 6 and you, by all means you can follow through with this guide and see how easy or hard it is to add it to Rails to make sure everything's working. So you, you can get down to this point, there's like about 12 steps and bits and pieces. Um, yeah, um, all these things you need to do to make sure it all works and everything. Now that's gone away. So how does it go away? Well, let's create a couple of resources and you'll see why. So first of all, I'm going to create the deed to do task resource, if you like, that we did in the previous episode for the beginner series. And uh, just show you how that actually uh, looks and works with Tailwind, uh, well, an easy version of Tailwind. So let's create that. So Rails um, generates a scaffold and because uh, this, this is just an easy way to do things uh, for a task. And let's just give it a, a title, a description, in text, a uh, do at column for in date time, a deleted at column. And if you're interested in soft deletion, that's in the previous episode, you're more than welcome to take a look. And then finally, the state, which is an integer. Okay, I'm not gonna cover any of what those are there in the previous episode, if you're really interested, but we're gonna create that scaffold and I'm gonna create a second scaffold, where's generate jet scaffold for a user. And then I'll just put a name and an email. We're not doing password authentication or anything at this stage just really showing you a couple of things. So we've got both of those built in. We can go back into our code, go to the uh, roots file, and then just set the root of the, the entire site, the home page, to the tasks index page. And then if we just refresh, uh, let's just see where have I got my local host anywhere. Uh, oh, I need to just migrate. Yes, I always forget to do that when I'm doing these, <laughs> these videos. There we go. So we can just refresh and we should get the page. Okay, now it looks pretty unstyled, but it's not. It's actually working with uh, with Tailwind already. How do we know that? Well, if I open up a uh, examples file that I have, trivial example here is just to open up application HTML ERB and apply some classes to the body tag, anti alias, font sans, and then um, BG Gray, let's increase that to like 700, okay? That's an actual class provided in, in Tailwind. It's nothing to do with anything I've done. And if I refresh the page, yes. So we obviously have Tailwind working. Uh, we can go a little bit further than that. We can just uh, decide to go down here. And let's just say if I want to copy and paste all of you, and I'm just going to paste it into the tasks index for now, but this is more like a, a user page more than anything else. But if I refresh, you'll see we have this table and it's all nicely styled as provided by Tailwind stuff. And if you want to get more components like this that people have put together, have a look at tailwindcomponents.com. Uh, tailwindcss.com is the, of course, the framework URL, but this has lots of copy and paste code you can use to be inspired by and you know make lots of changes to and play around with it. So nice and easy. So we know Tailwind's working and there's no configuration. It's all done for you, which is quite nice when starting a new project. Now, one thing I wanted to just do, uh, do is look at the users page. Now, this is going to be unstyled. Don't worry, I'm just going to leave it unstyled in this case. I'm not going to worry with too much styling because I want to demonstrate the last thing on the, uh, the show with the Rails 7 release. That is encryption or at work encryption. Now, you may be familiar with in transit and at rest encryption. In transit is over the wire, so HTTPS, SSL, that kind of stuff. At rest is the stuff that you will do for your database itself on its server. So for example, AWS, Amazon Web Services, will provide encryption at rest for your database to make it safe from outside attackers. But if you have access, legitimate access to that database, like say for example, a database remote connection, 
And you can still see all the data inside of it and you can still download that. So this is what, in what work encryption does. This is not the same thing whatsoever as password, uh, you know, salting and hashing. It's not anything to do with that. This is just for storing information in encrypted form in the database that your application, only your application can actually decrypt. So obviously there is going to be a little bit of a penalty there, but for things like personally identifiable information, like for example, maybe names, email addresses, social security numbers, national insurance numbers, addresses, you could have uh, all this kind of stuff in there that was encrypted. Now we need to do a few things first of all to get this to work. First thing we need to do is go, this is the guide for it. Um, there is a specific thing you need to do, which is this bin rails DB encryption in it. So if I just go into here and just um, type that in, bin rails db encryption in it that will actually give you a set of credentials okay in my case i'm not i'm showing the i'm showing these on camera but it doesn't matter it's just a test project so we just copy and paste that and then i need to do basically uh editor uh, let me see if i've got this remembered yes i do so in my case i'm going to load this up with text mate just in a different editor there we go this is my credentials file for this particular project i can just paste that into the bottom and then close that up and it says file encrypted and saved. So that's how you deal with encrypting, encrypted credentials in Rails. Um, but this is just adding some more credentials into there. Now we've done that, we need to restart the server. <laughs> okay, so let's not, let's not uh, try and keep the server running. And I'm also gonna load up a new tab and then go into the Rails console. We're then gonna go to this users model. Um, in fact, I may need to restart again because I forgot to do something else first. So let's go to the user model that we created. And I'm going to do uh, encrypt name. Uh, whoops, no, no, just encrypt name. Thank you very much. And I'm also going to do uh, encrypt email. Now, these are the examples given on the Rails website, but um, we're also going to use deterministic true. So what are the differences? If they both encrypt things. So if we just go just and restart everything again, just to be completely uh, paranoid and uh, more, more than anything else in these videos. And if we just reload that re user's resource and create a new user, let's create a user called Alice. And uh, email of alice at example.com, create a user. And in this case, we're also gonna create a uh, back to users and create a second user called Bob. And Bob at example.com, create user. Great, so back to users. So we have these two users and uh, they're, in the, they're in the database, they're visible. And if I, for example, go across to my Rails console and say, use it all, we see we have two users. Great, you say, well, well what is this encrypted thing done? What has it done? So if we go across the PG admin that's looking at this server, if I just refresh, uh, and we go to development, schemas, tables, and then the users table, and if I right click, I can do a view, edit data, all rows. See the bomb here now, in name and email, they're not the plain text values in the database. Even if you have a legitimate connection to the database and pull this data out, they're encrypted values, but not in here. Now, what's the difference, you may ask, between name and email deterministic? You may think, well, everything should be deterministic if you're, if you're decrypting it, surely? Well, yeah, not exactly. So the difference here is if I ask for user.where name is Alice, I get nothing. Okay, an empty array. That happens just because I can't query things that are just set as encrypt crypt's name. So if I ever want to find anyone by their name, I can't use that option. But if I just want to output that, for example, let's say the first line of their address, if I never need to search for it, um, so I don't know, maybe <laughs> this, is, this is more difficult than I imagine about thinking about something that I will never need to search for. But let's go on to the deterministic one. So if I do the same thing, but I do uh, email, is alice at example.com it comes up just fine so yes if you want to query on something use deterministic true otherwise use just encrypts and that will work fine again it's, it's kind of up to your your particular example your particular application as to which one is more appropriate for you but very handy tools to have for um, perhaps confidential information perhaps just sensitive information or indeed personal identifiable information. You can do something with IP address if you were storing IP address, for example, because you wanted a, a higher degree of security on that particular field. 
uh, pretty good. So I like the fact that that's available by default with Rails 7. I think it may have been even independently produced. Uh, I think it may just be packaged with Rails 7. But uh, those are the main things that I wanted to just show you. Oh, and also I just wanted to talk about, yes, import maps and how that's actually dealt with. So if we just go back onto our application here and go on to uh, more tools, developer tools. And if I go onto the network tab and then refresh the page, you see all the files come in now. They're all separate files and there is the hello world. So in this case, if I want to, for example, make a change in this hello world example, uh, it before when we compiled everything to a single file, this would all produce a single file. So that would mean it would have to regenerate that entire file because I made one change in here. Now, in this case, this will still be dealing with cache busting, but it'll only cache bust when I make a small change to that one small file. And because all the files are, hand, uh, are dealt with a little bit better with HTTP 2.0, then uh, everything is much nicer as far as dealing with cache busting is concerned with Rails 7. Uh, in Rails 6, there will be like two files here. There'll be application.js and application.css. And uh, I can't remember exactly because I don't have it in front of me. But yeah, there'll, there'll be two or three files uh, in here. I think vendor.js, it includes .js, the other ones, and then there'll be application. So yeah. So that's that. I'm pretty much happy with Rails 7 release so far. If you've got any questions about it, if you've if you haven't looked through the notes and reading through some of the other longer term guides, then um, do put them down below and I'll do my best to answer them there. Otherwise, we'll be covering in upcoming weeks with uh, new updates to the beginner series. And of course, I may well do some highlights on, on various parts of these new gems and we'll, we'll show about that kind of stuff. And there's obviously full guides linked in uh, the Rails dev post for at the encryption guide if you want more information about what that allows you to do and other bits and pieces and all, all kinds of stuff like that. I may well do the separate episode on that. But uh, for now, I think that's been a good quick start guide. Otherwise, you should be good to go with very similar kind of stuff that you do with Rails 6 and uh, head off and create new projects. If you enjoyed the video, do give it a thumbs up down below. Feel free to subscribe if you aren't already and click on the bell for notifications for more episodes. And um, yeah, we'll hopefully see you next time. Thanks for watching.